morning everybody and welcome to another Friday art session. Hello, if you're new here, you're very welcome. If you are one of my regulars, you are also very welcome. So basically everybody is very welcome. If you like what you see, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and a comment. I love to read your comments and I do try to answer as many as I possibly can. And if you like my style and what you see here, then do consider joining my Patreon and you can find the details for that in the description box, as you would expect. Um, it's autumn. It is the 5th of September. Let me guess. Let me check. Sorry. Yes, 5th of September. And you can tell that autumn is coming. And there's one... I love autumn. It's my favourite month. And there's one thing about it that... I don't do in any other season of the year. And please let me know if you feel the same way. Um, I zoom in on details. I don't do that in the springtime. I do occasionally, like I'll get interested in a daffodil or there'll be some birds that I want to do. And in the summer, the same thing. There might be a flower, but I just don't do it the way I do it in autumn. Um, winter, no, I'll paint landscapes. I'm first and foremost a landscape painter so I paint landscapes and they're usually sort of wide views and I can give you a bit of an idea here um, in this sketchbook like here's a church and yes there's a bird in it and there's some other birds and flowers but it's not the same thing and then just some bits and bobs and another house and some more houses and a bit of water this is what I usually do here I've done a little bit more detail in the hedgerow because I thought, well, why not? And the rest are just what I normally sort of do here. Um, sheep and owls. However, in the autumn, oh, and this is a this is a very, very exclusive first first look at this sketchbook because it's my new one. It's a Hanamula Nostalgia which I really love. It's great for mixed media, which is what I do. And it's got nice smooth pages and they're not quite, they're sort of just a little bit off white. I haven't got anything. Yes, I do. I've got a piece of card. I don't know if that's coming out on paper, but they're just slightly off white. What would be called winter white if you were buying a jumper? Um, so this is what I normally do. Occasionally I'll do this sort of thing. And in the autumn, it's almost as if I've found out how the zoom function on my eyes work because I will start looking at details like I will spend time sketching a leaf or I will spend time sketching a mushroom. Mushrooms are a passion. I think they're weird in the world of nature. Mushrooms get people in a funny sort of way and Last week, I had a mad idea because I do some collage as well as part of my mixed media practice. Um, last week, I had this mad idea to focus on the world of animals as if we were sort of sneaking up on them and peering under hedges, which sounds really horrible and awfully wrong. But bear with me. Um, when you see an animal, you don't see it the way you see it in some portraiture photos or artwork where you see the animal and there's nothing in front of it like this. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So you've got this animal and there's nothing else in the picture. In real life, there would be a bit of grass in front of the wing or a, even a leaf across the face where you want to see, that sort of thing. I didn't want to do that because the eyes are particularly important when communicating with the animal. But I started this and I thought, now I look at it, this is not finished and I'm going to do more to it. So what I want to show you today is how I'm doing this peek under the hedgerows view and these the next two pages you'll see what I mean this so the animal is still the subject but you've got all these other things going on around it and some of them are in front of the animal and these are all done with collage paper so and the pebble oh, I love doing these pebbles these are the best way to use up tiny little pieces of paper that you might have coloured for another project and you think, well, I'm never going to use something quite the, this small. Look at that there. That's just ridiculous. That should go in the bin. No, turn it into a pebble. Um, I've Some of these are actually done with marker. The others are collage. I'm not quite sure if that comes up on camera, but some of them are collage. The leaves are collage. 
All these leaves are collage, but the stems aren't. Same here. That was just something that I put on another collage project absolutely ages ago. This is the same. I'm not sure they belong to anything, but then they don't. I, I realized while I was doing this, they don't have to belong to anything. You can just put them there because supposing you had a garden and underneath that garden, you've got all these plants growing the way they want to. Like on the top of the garden, you'll see the plants and you think, well, you know, that looks good there or that looks good there. And you can train them or prune them and do things to them. Underneath, they're doing their own thing. And that's where the animals like to be, is in that undisturbed undergrowth. So what I'm wanting to do is paint the undergrowth. So what was important from this point of view was to not have any sky, but to have this almost from the perspective of another animal. So you're right at eye level with that animal under the garden bits or in the forest floor amongst all the undergrowth, that sort of thing. This is what I want to do today. Only I'm not going to do an animal because they take ages and it's not really something for a beginner beginner. Um, even if you've done some other things, if you do a lot of animals, by all means, you'll you'll be able to sort of pick this up as you go along. What I want to do today is a mushroom with some bits around it just to sort of bring it into a little scene. And I'm going to make it a frameable piece, which is something different. I have a piece of scrap paper which fits into a frame. And I promise I didn't plan that. I've just I had a bit of an off cut and I've got a frame. And I tell you what, they could be made for each other. You'll see what I mean in a bit. But I want to do a mushroom today and I would like to do, um, I'm going to do a Coprinius atramentaris, which is an ink cap variety of mushroom, not the shaggy one, the other smoother one, you'll see when we get to that. I don't want to go straight for the normal red and white mushroom that we always see. I thought, no, let's do something a little bit different. But what I do want to show you is how to create a background that looks mottly and busy. See, this could be left the way it is, but I've got this burning desire to add leaves coming in from the side just to give it a bit of extra. So I might do that. Um, and this, uh, what I want to show you is something that we can do that you can adapt to whatever you want to do. Like I said, if you want to do a bird, you can. If you want to do an animal, you can. The bird could be on the ground. If it's on the ground, you get to put pebbles in. Obviously, if the bird is up on a fence post like the owl, you're not going to see pebbles. Or if it's up in a tree, you're not going to see pebbles. You might have glimpses of sky in that, in that um, sort of setting. But the idea is, is to make an animal's eye view as if, Either you were as a human looking under the hedgerow or you were an animal going to join the animal that's already under there. I do hope that makes sense. It sort of does in my head, which is always a worry. Um, so the idea now is where do we start and how do we create something with this sort of richness that looks very, very autumny. But it's still got touches of summer because we've still got some green things happening, although the leaves are changing. I really love these red leaves. I think they will be going into the picture today. Um, I want to be able to get this cusp of autumn coming, but summer not quite finished. So you've got this little mini season in between autumn and um, summer and autumn. And I quite like that. So I thought, let's try that and... It's a mixed media piece and as a complete departure, I'm going to do the background in watercolour, which I rarely, rarely ever do. So let us get on. So just before I start, the watercolours I'm going to use are my QOR or Core. I'm not sure how they are. It's pronounced. It's Golden Brand from America and they come in this fabulous tin. This is how many you get in the fabulous tin. So it's quite large. I'm now using the tin for when I go out to my art group. I've got a few emergency things like always need a white pastel, a tortillon, something to sharpen something with extra erasers, a cloth, a kneadable eraser and a bit of spare paper for making sure that acrylic markers work. They all fit perfectly into my little survival kit tin, which I can fit, it's light, and I can fit that into my bag alongside my pencil cases and other 
actual drawing things. So this is my emergency survival kit and I have this with me because you never know what's needed. And um, I would add a pair of scissors to that if I'm collaging. Usually don't collage at art group because I'm at somebody else's house and I don't want to make a huge mess. So these here are the watercolours. Let me see if I can just zoom that in. There we go. Um, this is Venetian red, sap green, Naples yellow, binder, oops, no, transparent brown oxide rather than just reading everything I see, um, raw umber natural, and some sort of indigo. Really, really nice colour palette. And I've actually put them into my one of my watercolour palettes here. I do have watercolours. I can watercolour, but I just don't ever do it. And part of the reason I don't ever do it is because the way I do my art, I put layer upon layer upon layer and I cover everything up. And it seems such a pity, especially with some of these expensive ones like the Daniel Smith. I've got Shadow Violet, Luna Blue and Moon Glow. Love them. But they're beautiful granulating ones like the Schmincke granulating ones. And I don't want to cover them up. So there, I've got a few things that I have to tweak in my own mind. I seem to have an incomplete set here. But just to give you some idea, that's the sap green there, which is a beautiful sap green. Uh, this is the indigo. And we've got Naples yellow and... I've got these mixed up as well. I think this, there's some attention that needs to be plan, um, paid to my supplies and how I've organised them. But this here is the basic palette and that's what I'm going to use for the background. Okay, so starting off, and this is my little piece of card. It's a piece of Fabriano water um, mixed media card and it comes on a huge sheet which I then cut off as needed and this was an off cut that actually worked. So let's pop those aside because we don't need those either. I need some water and I need a sizable brush. I also need a something to create a resist and I'm going to use a white neo color one and I've drawn a small picture here that will become apparent in a second. What I'm doing at the moment will make absolutely no sense because we none of us can see it. I'm with you there. I can't see it either. What I'm doing is I'm doing some random stripes of Neo Color 1. And that is the non-water soluble one of the Neo Colors. I'm not sure, I, I can't see it very well either, so you're not alone. But basically, trust me, there are some random stripes on the paper. And I've made a little sort of mushroom in the middle there. Um, and what they're going to do is form a resist when I put the watercolours on. So you can't, um, you'll, you won't see this. You'll see them in a minute. And we can make them a little bit brighter if we need to. So don't forget, don't use Neo Colour 2 because it's water soluble. Now, the next thing, I've got a large brush. This one is a number 12, I think, by the look of it. No, it's number 10. Just a normal round brush. And I'm going to go at random into the watercolours. As you can see, they're absolutely glorious colours. That was not a sponsored ad, by the way. I That was me going into an art shop and buying art materials sort of thing. Not too concerned about the table. It's not the best one. And I've got a little mound there that I don't want to go over. I'm going to, as you can see now, my stripes that I put into the background are all making an appearance. That's the indigo, I think. Let's have a bit of that. Yeah, that's nice. Nothing like indigo for making deep shadows, especially when combined with the other colours in that set. Now around here, I shall go a little bit careful. Let's just make sure that I'm even on the camera I'm so sorry about that I hope you could see all that here we go I'm just going a little bit carefully around the mushroom shapes I don't have to be obsessive about this funny enough because I'm going to do the mushrooms in gouache but I don't want to make them too messy a bit more water there and it doesn't matter that it's patchy here in the background that matters because we don't want a harsh line. 
the way that will look when we're finished is that it will be all motley as though the sun was shining through it. And then without washing the brush, I'm going straight into the yellow ochre because this is my sort of earth mound. It's a bit of green, bit of brown, bit of everything, as you would expect. And that's the background done. Right, so there's sort of an, a bit of a balancing act here as to what I can fit on camera and showing you close up because if I zoom it out, it's, it gets too small. I tried bringing the camera down closer to the paper, but what happens then is I keep knocking the camera with the tip of my brush because it's so close to the camera. So this is kind of the sweet spot. And I know normally do not paint on square paper either. So there's everything's all wrong. So do bear with. Right, that is that layer and you can put another layer over that and make it more vibrant or just leave it the way it is. And as you can see now, you can see all these little stripes that I've put in. So that's that. I'm going to dry that and I shall return. OK, um, that's now crispy dry. Now, if you are a watercolorist and a proper one, which I'm not, I'm only interested in each of my media in the way they fit into my mixed media practice so i don't ever see myself making a picture with just soft pastels or just oil pastels probably gouache is the one i'd be most likely to make a whole picture out of but even then i can't resist sneaking in some markers so no i look at everything uh, the way it fits into mixed media so i like gouache as a substrate that is my number one to put down first but watercolour and Japanese watercolours, um, they are also absolutely amazing substrates. Um, so I haven't, what I mean by this is I haven't taped this or stretched it. It's just a scrap of paper. This might not work what we're doing today. So therefore, good that it's just a scrap of paper. It might work brilliantly, in which case I will be keeping this and framing it and it's all good. But I don't stretch it. It is a bit buckled. It is curled up. It doesn't worry me very much. Um, if it bothers me, I can tape it down, but it doesn't at the moment because I like to be able to move it around. And I've been known to iron things if they wouldn't lay flat. So like I said, I will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Trust me. Right. That's the um, watercolour layer. Now I'm going to go on with some white gouache and I apologize to any of you who have now fainted dead away with the confessions I've just made <laughs> ironing paper good grief trust me I have done it it was an emergency it just wouldn't lay down and as you can imagine I was starting to panic so by I found that by ironing it flat that actually did work right so first of all just putting some base colours down, a fair bit of white mixed in with a, let me just introduce you to my untidy palette. This is my palette, never clean it, don't have plans to, um, because I mix colours directly from it. That has an advantage that I get some absolutely amazing colour. Um, it has a disadvantage that often I can't repeat it. So I'll do something fabulous and I can't do it again because I didn't have the colour there. But it allows for a lot of spontaneity in my work, which I also like. So, And I've got some different colour, different brushes. Normally, as if you're one of my regulars, you will know that normally I will use a dome blender for all of these sorts of things, like, for example, this one here. That's a dome blender, and it's got this scrubby tip which I can literally scrub with don't have to worry about ruining the tip try that with this one and see how far you get sorry not sure if you can see that doesn't appear to be in focus I think that's better goodness knows okay so I'm also using just a regular round brush this one's a little bit bigger than I want I think we'll go with this one a number three round brush 
and that is just because it affords me a bit more precision. Now, the thing I like about gouache is where I've allowed myself to cut loose with the substrate of watercolour, I can now neaten all those lines up because gouache is more opaque. So you can go over watercolour with gouache, but you cannot go over gouache very easily with watercolour. You can, however, mix watercolour and gouache together to do things. So maybe there's a video there. Right, just making some little guys here now and closing up some of the gaps. That's just a baby one. But this is what I love about art. Technically, I'm using gouache wrong. Here, air quotes there. I don't care. And no one else seems to either. That's the funny thing about life. The things that I think I'm worried about, no. Um, I use gouache wrong because I'm using it to create muddy colours. I'm calling them muted because I like to be a little bit polite to myself sometimes. But at the end of the day, let's call a spade a spade. They are muddy colours. A little bit of a thing there. And that's actually the biggest fear of most gouache artists is that the colours will go muddy. It's actually what I set out to do. Just clean that stem up and then I can put some darker colour under the cap of the other one. What I'm going to do here is I create this picture now and then I will go over the top of the mushrooms with some coloured pencil and also the little mound there of soil that they're on. And I will then do some details with my collage. Okay. Either side of that stem. But yeah, these details of autumn, they're just amazing. Like I said, do let me know and see how you feel about that. Tell me if I'm alone in this. But autumn is just totally, it's got some magic that the other seasons just don't have. Can't match it. Right. What I'm doing there is just preparing the ground for where I might want to put some water, some markers and other things later. Because these kind of split like that. Okay. That's basically it for the gouache layer. It goes along quite nicely. So um, I will dry that and I shall return. Okay, so that's nice and dry. And now what I'm going to introduce in is some colored pencil. And I use a lot of different uh, sorts. Um, luminance, Caran d'Ache Luminance is one of my favorites. Derwent Drawing, Derwent Lightfast. They're all absolute favorites, but a few of you have put in requests for polychromos to see a little bit more polychromos in use. And to my eternal discredit, I don't use them as often as I should, even though I've got the full set, um, full set syndrome here, um, I don't use them as much as I should. So I've got some nice colours out today, which I will tell you, I won't put them up on the screen, I'm just going to say them. So um, you can see what I'm using there. It tends to flow a little bit better that way. This one is green gold and I'm going to use that to get some colour on the top of the mushroom. It marries nicely with the background as well and just bring that down. So yeah, polychromos is also a good choice. I really... I don't know, I get into a habit, even though I've got lots of pencils and lots of colours in those pencils, I'll forget about them. I'm, I really am that stupid. I can sit here with a whole heap of pencils in front of me and forget that I own them. So, yeah, top that. If you can match my freak. <laughs> um, it's just, it's really sad. But there you go. Okay, so that was green gold. Now I'm going to go in with some burnt umber because I want to give some shade 
here. I'm assuming the light, what light there is, will be coming from this way. So I'm going to just shade that a little and keep it grainy because that's kind of the effect you get with these mushrooms. A little bit here too. What I like about this, I don't like pencils touching me and doing their own thing. What I like about this is I can come back and burnish these colours with a lighter coloured pencil. And Derwent Drawing Chinese White is my weapon of choice usually there. Not keen on the way that is there in the background, so I'm just going to make a small correction with my coloured pencil. It's not too much of this, but just a little bit on the baby ones. I'm not going for any sort of hyper-realism here. If it happens, that's great. It won't because I'm not trying. Um, it's not the style I do with this. I sort of... If I do that at all, I keep it for my birds, which is, yeah. Um, what I'm going for is believability. When we've finished this, I want you to look at that and say, oh, look, mushrooms, not sort of peer at it and say, um, what, what is that exactly? I don't want that. I'd like people to be able to tell. Now, it wouldn't be autumn for me without caput mortuum, which means dead head in Latin. Um, I've, I don't know. I did read about it once. I shall look it up, actually, and I'll be able to tell you next time. But anyway, it is a beautiful sort of violety, browny, warm colour that I love. And like I said, it wouldn't be autumn without it. So I'm going to just use the smallest amount just to say I've used it. So that next time I announce to my husband that I need to go to the art store, he doesn't raise a quizzical eyebrow, which would be a fair thing. The other thing I absolutely love is this burnt ochre, really gold oxide sort of colour. And these are all still polychromos. And just adding to some of this and warming it up with a bit of a warm glow. Right. People will tell you colour pencil has to take ages. It doesn't. It really depends on the person. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but it's a really good addition to the kit. So if you are a polychromos person, then you can use it in this setting here. I'm swapping now to Derwent Drawing to Chinese White, which I love as well. And I'm going to burnish some of this with that and put some highlights and preserve some of these highlights. A bit here. And what this does is pushes what I've just done down into the paper a little bit. I've gone over that a bit. Eraser to the rescue and remove it. It's as simple as that. We can also put some onto these stems and definitely some onto these little guys here. Not going to have it there. Let's see, what have we got? We've got a dark sepia. I'm gonna go down there and make this one a little bit darker because it's behind that stem. It won't be too dark because these are the young ones and they will be lighter. But if I go in with dark sepia first, and of course, if I use it in one spot, I will use it in others. So let's make a bit of a shadow on there. Just like that. I'm che checking to see that I'm still on camera. Because I do get carried away and forget people are watching. Right. Just blend all that together. And then knock it back a bit with the white and blend it in which works particularly well here too. And working in the direction of growth. 
um, we can then come back and just big up some of the shade again this is with dark sepia I don't know I've been doing this for ages but I am horrible at remembering the colors some of them I can remember but even when I use them quite often I, I prefer to check anyway because I'm using three or four different brands of pencil it's better to check than to assume and get it wrong and waste somebody's time because they're looking for a color that doesn't exist okay now we're going to curl these up a bit still using dark sepia a little bit of a curl there and then i will grab my faber castell um, pit artist pen and this is indian ink this is going to give me some really nice fine details here where the caps are splitting as they do in this variety of mushroom and some of the blackest blacks you will get in the art world. There's an eternal search for dark darks and light lights when you're painting. This could have a little bit of more variation and maybe the just the suggestion of some gills, which you will just see over the top of the black gouache. Right, so how am I looking? Because the thing that holds my camera up is right across the middle where I'm actually working. So it's very difficult to see anything at all. Um, just see, this one is Venetian red. It's another one I like. So now it's a matter of doing this as much as I think is necessary and blending them together, making them a bit smoother. And that finishes the mushrooms. This is no good because we've got a little bit of a halo here. So just going around that and actually using a bit more pressure now because I'm on the last layers. Whereas before, I didn't want to squash down the tooth of the paper too early. Now I can because we're almost done here. All over by the shouting. Now, the next thing to do is to consider whether the background is right or not, or whether there should be some darker bits introduced. Because, for example, this doesn't stand out very much. So let's try a chromium green oxide because that's kind of the colour I've got there. And just bring in some extra background detail now. Um, for example, where is my indigo blue? Dark indigo. This is a Caran d'Ache one. Nothing will darken a green like that and just add some extra um, detail. What I'm also going to do is, first of all, is put more detail in with the white up here. This is a bit of a toing and froing exercise because you'll do a little bit and then you'll realize something else further up needed doing and a bit more attention. So then you do that and then you come back and realize that the red you used or the blue you used is not sufficient. So I'm just putting some more of these in to give some background interest which is what I've done on the others then we can come with our dark sepia do some of those and again I'm using polychromos and you can near here this is in front of that so we can this mound is in front so we can add some scribbled undergrowth here and don't make it neat because again we're in a forest nobody has come along with a strimmer or a lawnmower and cut the grass it's all sort of all over the place and what I do is I just read the picture so for example 
if there's a bit of brown here already, I'll use a bit more brown and let some parts come in from the side because when we paint a picture, we're painting a portion of what's really there. For example, we can assume that this picture continues out indefinitely to the sides and there'll be more interest happening up here. There may be something here, there might be, a, I don't know, there might be a shrew or a vole sitting here or a piece of dead wood or something. We've not got it on our picture, but that doesn't mean to say it's not there. So sometimes something that's here will intrude into the picture from the side, if you see what I mean. And so up here, for example, we might have one or two bits that start here, completely off the picture, but we're going to get to see some of them and that's what anchors the picture together. Right. What else could we do? This is another colour. That occurs in the background as well. This is the burnt ochre. This is the time of year I can just let my love of earth tones and warm colours off the leash. You could come in as well with a bit more watercolour if you wanted to and deepen some of these areas. I tend to leave them a little bit lighter um, because this one's pine green. I tend to leave them a bit lighter because they add variation to the background. And as you can see here, you can also use your colour pencils to increase or decrease colours. So let's go there for example and then extend that out and don't just have it there put some over here. It's really important that you use colours in more than one place otherwise it just looks a bit weird and what that's done is helped and I will help it more with some of my forest Derwent Light Fast Forest because I'm not keen on the colour I will then just put some more in with that. And what that's done is where this is at, where the mushroom is lightest, this is now dark in the background. Forest is one for your kit. If you've got a Christmas wish list started, put forest at the top of it and mention it two or three more times as well. Okay. So that's that bit so far so good what we can do then is let's use some of these on their side this one's burned umber just on its side just to give some more color and blend it in a little bit don't want to make a vignette frame for it i just want to give it some texture and i'm giving it some texture with different colors And that can be extended up as well. There's all sorts of wispy little things growing in these areas. Right. Okay. And then make sure that this floor looks like you want it to look. That could be a little bit lighter. And that's a bit lighter. And light pencils will also burnish the colour down. So you can add some of this to the background if you want little glimpses of light coming through. I don't particularly. I want to keep it nice and dark. Not in love with this bit here. I've got a couple of choices. I can either remove it and the, the battery operated eraser is my first choice. I can either remove it or I can tough it out and see what happens when I've put some leaves over the top of this. Or I can change it by putting another colour over the top and making it a bit wider. I'm going to go for the tough it out and see what it looks like when I've put some leaves over the top of it. And I'm going to put some pebbles around here. Like I said, I love the pebbles because they lead your eye into the picture as well and means that there's no waste. So, for example, I've got some bits and bobs here that I have already 
cut. I'll show you how I do it as well, but we can also use the bits I've got, which if they fall the right way will look a bit more interesting. And these can be put on at random being aware that there will be a frame here. I've not gone for a white border on purpose. I'm not too concerned about that. I quite like the idea that I've got some red ones as well, because normally when we paint a toadstool or poisonous mushroom, the one we go for is the famous fly agaric. That's the first one of the season. Everybody seems to do it, and I'm determined not to. However, in order to have some of that sort of look in the picture, I've put it into a red pebble instead. So, yeah, we can just put some pebbles in like that. So I plot them out a bit. And then, now I'm using Eileen's original tacky glue, which is my absolute favourite for this sort of thing. And what I will do there is just make some glue marks and put the pebbles in. This might not even be what I've practiced. I'm not that studied about this, to be fair. I, I want it to look more spontaneous and desperately, desperately don't want any awkward patterns developing, which look ridiculous. So I'm just going to glue some pebbles in. There's a big one that can go there. That sort of thing. Some others. Some of these will be hidden by the frame, so be careful how big they are or what you do with them. You put some more in later. You don't have to do them all now. And above all, we don't just glue the pebbles in when doing a collage. You've got to anchor them into the scene somehow. And what I do with that is with a little bit of shade under them and a bit of highlight on the pebble itself. So that's that. Now, this is no good because there's a pattern has developed here in the corner. So what I want to do is I want to grab a terribly boring looking piece of paper. Trust me, they are sometimes the best bits. This was a wing in a previous um, pattern. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut it off. And then what I do is just cut a sort of irregular shape out that might serve as a bit of a pebble so that I can put it down here and break the pattern up. When you get really good with your cutting, you may be very good already, but if not, when you get good and get a decent pair of scissors, these are Tonic brand by Tim Holtz. They've got a nice big area here, super sharp and precise, and you can get quite small um, bits. So say you've got a piece of, well, that actually would serve as it is, we could pop that somewhere. I don't want to put it too close to the bottom because we'll lose the whole thing in the border. But when you get quite good at cutting, you might have a little piece of paper like that that looks fabulous and you don't want to get rid. So you just cut around to make a very small pebble. Okay, you might stick that there, I think those two and that's probably enough pebbles for this area there are pebbles in forests there's all sorts of bits of detrius on the forest floor now at the moment what i've achieved is the fabulous effect of having glued some paper to some other paper these are not pebbles not yet so what i'm going to do is to put my hand on them because the warmth of my hand will dry the glue and then we can anchor them down to the seam because you can't just have pieces of paper sitting up like that. This is the difference between collage that looks arty and collage that looks a little bit more crafty. And I don't mean to be rude there. I do art and craft. I mean, my day job is a craft writer. What I'm saying is there's a difference and it's a subtle difference. And one of the ways you can get it to look a little bit more 
arty is to pay more attention to the details and really anchor it into the scene by adding some shadow. I'm going to use my Aqua Colour Brush by Molito, and this one is warm grey. And I'm just going to go underneath using the pebble. I'm going to put some shadows under them. That's step number one. Again, we're assuming that the light's coming this way. See here, you have to put some on the actual pebble. Here, it's just on here, so like that. I might put some towards the bottom as well. That's a bit dark for that. I'm going to use a different one. That one works a bit better, and of course it will cast a shadow there. So already now we've got anchors to the ground. The next thing is an eco line marker and just put some on the rock. The reason why I've swapped the markers is because this one is a lot less rich coloured. As you can see, it's really good for blending it in and just with no particular pattern in mind. A little bit there because I think I missed with the other one. So now we've got pebbles sitting on the ground. You can use this also to put a little bit of shadow around your mushrooms because they do need some they need to be anchored in as well you can use these markers to make more shadow in the background if you want to or indeed grayer color down you know so there's all sorts of things you can use now i never ever do just the medium value and the dark value without a light as well so here we might put a little bit of highlight on some of them. Not all of them are going to take it. Actually, I make cards as well, and some of these pieces of paper have spray on them where I've made a card, and that's why they're so motley and weird looking. Right. Now, the next thing I don't like is this here needs a little bit of grass, so I'm going to reach for a marker and I'm going to reach for my very very fine um, Tooley Art acrylic markers. This one's a number 14. Let me just make sure that it's working. It is. So because with all those waxy layers from the pencils we need something that's going to go in front of them and of course we do it elsewhere too. You can try this with some coloured pencils, but they won't always work. Because like I said, there are lots of layers there and the paper will get to the point where it doesn't want to talk to you anymore. So I want a, an acrylic marker and I'll do a slightly lighter one. I can't give you colours for these because they don't do them. This one is a number 18 from the Greens range. The last one was a number 14 from the Greens range. They come in sets. And I thought they were a cheaper brand from China. That one's a bit too bright, actually. Um, but they're not. They're actually a family-run business in America. And um, they're available most places. Amazon have them. And they're fabulous. I love them. I use them a lot in my work. See, here we can, again, don't just do it here. But them everywhere because every layer that you put on is a start of the process of getting that nice depth this one I think needs a bit of a clean Let's see if I can coax a bit out and let some extend right up because even though you've just spent time making a mushroom and you think well why do I want to draw over the top of that that's the focal point no not in a forest it's not it's just another thing on the forest floor and some things will be in front of it like some of these fine grasses will be in front of it and some things will be behind so some of these grasses go over the top of the mushrooms 
I'm glad that I waited that out. That's going to work. Okay, and of course, there'll be some from down here. Some grasses sometimes get trodden on or just fall over because they've reached the end of their life. So make sure that you have some going to the side. What I will do with the bottom of this now is to use this forest to just colour in here and there and blend the grasses in and again anchor them down. Like so. Right, now we're up to the sticking on of the leaves, which sounds awfully official and important, and that's because it is. It's the last bit before we've finished our picture. Right, so the next bit here is where I'm plotting the leaves, and I will show you how I do those. It's quite simple. Um, I choose the colour I want to use, and then I cut the a strip. So for a small leaf, I might cut a strip that's about a half an inch. And then I'll cut that into smaller pieces. And then with my scissors, cut a very rough leaf shape out. I have a lot of beautiful die dies that I use for my cards, and I refuse to use them for my art. They're not art in my very prejudiced opinion. Sorry. They are too even. They're too uniform and you will get the same thing in every single picture, which is not what you're wanting in this sort of setting. So what we're wanting here is to have everything a little bit more organic looking. I mean, I'm not, if you really, if you've got lots of dyes, I, I've got heaps of Sizzix dyes and so forth. I could use those. I could make this so much easier on myself by cutting out a piece of fern and putting across here. And if that's your thing, by all means, I'm not judging. It's just from my point of view, being my picture, I prefer to do it this way and have just a bit more organic variation to it. And it also compartmentalizes it slightly. So whereas my cards are all perfectly the same, let me just grab one. This is one that I've just worked on in the last day or two. And as you can see, it's got little flowers and bits of greenery here. And it's all completely uniform. And that's great because that's fine for a card. That's absolutely good. But for my art, I want it all looking like I made it, to be fair. So what I do with these here is I will plot where they're going to go and decide and put some glue down. Sometimes I glue the leaves and sometimes I put the glue onto the page because I can move them around a little bit. These have come to the point where they're a little bit too big almost. So those are the first two. And these represent the bits and pieces that hang down in a forest. And as you can see, it's going to go over my mushroom just a little bit. And I don't mind that. It's what I'm after, actually. So a little bit here. And then a bit down here. Doesn't really have a right way up. These are all motley because I was making Christmas cards with this and I had enough of it. So... I thought, well, I'll use some for my collage. So that's why these are sprayed. Um, okay, so now we might put another one up here, say. Let's see how that goes with just four. Remembering that the first leaf you put in, I think that is upside down. The first leaf you put in will be hidden by the border if you're framing it. That's not going to happen if you're doing it in your sketchbook. Over here, see now that covers the grass because that's how it is in real life. Same here. That's going to be a little bit on there, but I don't want it predictable. This is already too much of a pattern. I've got one coming down here and one coming down here. Not trying to have a floral arrangement here. That can go there. And I'll make that make sense in a minute. So, for example, I might put a bit here. Whoop, excuse me. Put the paper and made it spin. That's fine. 
hardly anybody was harmed. There. Um, on these other pieces here, I've got a couple of bits. How was I planning to put that? That's right, like that. Again, these will be a little bit hidden by the frame, so you can bring it in a little bit if you want, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to allow it to happen naturally. Then this one might go here, a little bit down from it this is another sort of plant again the main part of this plant might be here but we're only seeing a little bit of it okay so now we've got through that bit I'll show you again just keep cutting as many leaves out as are required a little bit of waste but not too much I think it's within reason if you get bigger pieces and you don't want to waste it well, you put them aside somewhere, get a jam jar and make sure it's dry and clean and pop them in for pebbles. In fact, sometimes what I do, if I don't want to do anything, you know, sometimes when you get those days when you just, I don't want to do art today, it's rare, but sometimes just nothing doing, not interested. Um, you can sit down and just do something towards future projects for example get all the little bits of paper that you are sick of looking at and cut them out to make pebbles you could put that there like that so that it overlaps the one next to it and comes down there and then we'd have a piece here like so that would work and then I can show you how I would colour those leaves. See, sometimes you can put the actual glue on the leaf. Because at the moment these are overlapping, but it's not obvious. But it will be when we're finished. Oh, God, I love glue on my fingers. It's my absolute favourite thing when I go to grab something and I drag five or six other things along with it. That bit there. That can go down there. And my dog's decided to start barking. I'm not sure you can hear. She's downstairs, so if she leaves the circus down there, we won't have to worry. This one can come here. Okay. And you don't want much more than this on a small picture because you'll swamp it and overwhelm it. And this is another reason I didn't go for the ubiquitous white, red and white toadstool because I wanted those red leaves to stand out. If I wanted those to blend in a little bit more, we could have done a red and white toadstool and it would have been absolutely fine. Um, it would have all blended in then and become a little bit more sort of subtle. But I wanted those to stand out. So, as you can see, I've got some plastic bags here and I put all my paper scraps in. And when I want to make a pattern then, I've got a bag for green, I've got a bag for red, and it's already sort of organised because I am a bit of a digger. I like to have a dig in a box, but sometimes it's overwhelming. Right, next thing now is how we put the colours on the leaves. Now, for this one here, I'm just going to get my forest pencil and I'm going to make some lines in it. And then I'm going to just do that bit. Again, some lines. I don't know what these are. They might be a sort of plantain, I think. But that will do very nicely. I might use my Caran Dash Green Oxide to colour this bit and give them a bit of variation because, again, I never just do one thing. So... That's kind of what you need to do with those. You might consider, say, a Tombow here and just put, this one is actually a Lyra Chrome Green, just to put some richer colour. You might also go just down there to blend that in and that makes them part of the scenery. Now, I'm going to speed this next bit up and I will put all of the veins on the leaves and then I'll leave one, no pun intended, so that I can show you what I'm doing. And again, if you need this in real time, my Patreon has real time videos without speeding up. I, I did do it for ages, but I'm not, it doesn't, um, yeah, 
I can I've got more time over there the uploads on this this side of the world um, aren't great so yeah I will do that and then I'll show you what I was doing I just realised that I've been talking to you for about 15 minutes and haven't said a damn thing. <laughs> it wasn't filming, it stopped. So I'm so sorry about that. Let me see where I can, it can catch up. To start with, I did my veins with my Forest Green Light Fast Pencil. And you go one way from the vein out and then from the other side is from the edge towards the vein. And this one makes some nice and deep dark colors. Then I went in with my green oxide from Karen Dash and put some color on the leaves as well here and there. And as you'll notice here, a slightly brighter green, I went on to say that if you want to make them a little bit brighter, you can use an acrylic marker. And this one is a brush tip marker from Thule Art where you can go just on the edges like so. Again, I don't do it all over because at this time of the year, no two leaves are the same color. So you can have all this variation. Up on this one here, I used a yellow marker. And this is again, it's the Thule Art markers come in kits, so you can't choose the colors. And although most of them are wonderfully muted, the brush tip markers I wish they were more muted. There's a couple of nice colours in there, but they're aimed at rock painting and, I suspect, children. Um, so they want bright colours, which is absolutely fine. But I would prefer something a little bit more muted. But So that's what you can do with that. So, yeah, I am sorry about that. Um, let me make it up to you by showing you what I do on the red ones. Now, I'm, I would sharpen my pencil before I started. And then start with this one's a Caran d'Ache Carmine Lake. Start with a vein in the centre. And again, on one side, I, um, I go from the outside in. So colour that edge, but then come down as if it were veins. Letting some of that motley nature of the paper show through if you possibly can. And the other side, I come from the vein to the top because what that does is gives the leaf some shape. And you can big that up. What have we got here? We've got a burnt ochre 10%. You can big the light bit up by just going over it. You can still see the shine, the spots through it like that. So that's how I would do all of those. So I will do these and I will get, I'll speed this next bit up. And I'll do this and then I'll get back to you and um, we can put some stems in as well. Right, my phone did that again. I don't know why, but it's stopped filming again. But anyway, what I'm doing here is what you have seen me do before on the green, only this time I'm using reds. And just to finish off there just with a few strokes. So as you can see, it gives the leaves a really, really lovely shape. So I started out with a, a vein down the center and then on one half come out from the vein, on the other half come up to the vein from the outside and then go in with the other lighter color. And because I can't be sure what's been said and what hasn't and what's cut out, um, one is a the light colour is Burnt Ochre 10% by Caran d'Ache Luminance and the dark colour is Carmine Lake by Caran d'Ache Luminance. And these two are going to be a mainstay of the autumn practice, I can see. Then I would go in again with my sepia Pentel marker. Sepia rather than black because autumn is a time of browns and things like that. Just 
get that stem up there. I'm not going to do too much of a centre vein. Um, and I am going to fix some of these. Where is my brush? Need to sharpen my forest pencil here because this one's lost a bit of definition. It's not going to get it back either because of the acrylic marker over the top. So that might be just the leaf I have to put up with. That's fine. And this one too. You can do a little bit. The main thing to remember when you're working with mixed media is to allow the preceding layer to dry because if you don't, it won't work very well. It'll hate you for it because these are not great with moisture. Right, let me just reach over here and grab this frame. And this is the bit I wanted to show you. This is just a cheap frame from Amazon. I couldn't do this again if I tried. I'm actually going to clean that um, rather than using the glass, which is going to give glare. Look at that. You could not get that again if you tried, and I honestly didn't. It's only a little bit out. I'm going to put this in the frame without the glass because of the glare. I don't want to blind you all, but um, when I do frame it properly, I'll put that glass in. But just a cheap frame like this can make such a difference and I'm really quite happy with that actually. Um, as you can see we've lost a little bit of the leaves and so forth but no harm done really um, and the pebbles have got their little bit of anchoring um, colour under there. So this is how I do my autumn pictures and um, I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said if you want to see things like this in more detail, and also I'm doing some animal ones on my Patreons and some birds as well. Um, so block your ears, unashamed plug for my Patreon. Do have a look over there at the moment because there is a um, coming up in September list of what you can expect and so forth. And um, this is one of the things I'm going to be doing with them. And I'm going, like I said, I'll do an animal of some sort. I'm not sure which animal it would be at the moment. I might ask them to choose, but um, I'm sort of thinking of a fox. Don't know. We'll see how we go with that, because um, sometimes the smaller animals are better. But we are definitely going to do a fox. We've just finished sheep and things like that. Um, actually, no, we've not quite finished sheep because I do want to do one more sheep at some point. But um, and then foxes, because foxes are an autumn thing as well. So we're really getting into that at the moment. So do have a look. And like I said, if you like what I do and normally I'm not this stupid with the camera, so I can manage that too. Please do consider joining us over there so i hope you've enjoyed this don't forget to leave a like and subscribe and a comment and let me know what you think and let me know if you like to zoom into autumn or if there's another season that you do that in as well but um yeah thank you for being with me and enjoy the rest of your day bye for now take care bye <laughs>